What's up, everybody? Time for Nostalgia Trap. My name is David Parsons. Thanks for joining me. We're talking about a topic that I've thought about a lot over the years, and you probably have too if you're on the left, which is the topic of violence. Why don't a bunch of leftists just get together and get a bunch of guns and try to do a revolution? I've certainly had that thought, and you probably have too, but you know what? We've gone down that road before. We don't need to wonder what that's like. And my guest today has amazing stories to tell us about that moment. I'm talking about the 1960s and 1970s, when groups like the Weather Underground and the Black Liberation Army and a bunch of others tried to get guns together and start a revolution. They were robbing banks. They were killing cops. It was an electrifying moment. Tons of bombings, all sorts of violence. You want left-wing violence, it came in the 60s and 70s, and it came with a reaction, too. And there was right-wing violence as well. Um, But my guest today is someone who, like I said, has spent a lot of time thinking about this, and his book is incredible. His name is Daniel Chard. His book is called Nixon's War at Home, The FBI, Leftist Guerrillas, and the Origins of Counterterrorism, out right now from the University of North Carolina Press. Really, really impressive research and just an incredible perspective as we get into. Daniel has experience with the left and with ideas of, 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 of kind of um, militant, the militant left in the 1990s. And the craziest part about Daniel's story that he tells in this book is how the state, how the American government reacted to all this violence. The FBI and other law enforcement networks that are going to expand their surveillance networks, bring back all that Cold War spying shit, and enter us into the new age of militarized law enforcement that is still fucking people over today. So this is another ear, another place where we can see the kind of intense, unexpected legacy of the 1960s and 1970s. So we ended up having a really, really intense discussion here. I hope you enjoy it. We've got lots more of these intense nostalgia trap discussions out there, especially behind the paywall on our Patreon. If you want to check those out, patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. There's tons of bonus episodes on there, and lately we've been putting up A lot of written work from Justin Rogers Cooper in his In the Trap column. And very excited to be presenting new episodes of a little side podcast with Yasmin Nair we're calling Gender Trap, where we talk about radical politics, culture, and of course how that all links up with the real trap, gender and sexuality. So if you want to check out all that stuff and help support our program and help support good left media, independent left media, Go to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap and subscribe to our program. Five bucks a month you can cancel whenever you want. And we appreciate everyone who throws us a few dollars. Thanks so much and enjoy this conversation. Here is me talking with Daniel Chard. All right, Daniel Chard, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, your book popped out to me on the UNC Press website. Uh, it's kind of perfect material for what we talk about on Nostalgia Trap. I want to say the name of it. Um, your book is called Nixon's War at Home, the FBI, Leftist Guerrillas, and the Origins of Counterterrorism. So juicy. A lot of stuff going on there. What I, I guess I, I guess we can start with, you know, what, what drew you to uh, to writing about the 60s. I'm always curious about that because I, I ended up writing about similar things, but you know, the anti-war movement and, and that sort of thing. But yeah. I have my own GI coffee houses, right? GI coffee houses, that whole world, which I think is like tangentially connected to a lot of the mm-hmm. stuff you're talking about. But yeah. so how'd you how'd you get there? How are you uh, 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 getting to study the 60s and Vietnam? So it was a pretty my path to that was pretty unorthodox. I come it, it came from. Uh, being involved in another series of movements in the late 90s and early 2000s. I was involved in the animal rights movement and environmental movement and the the, the movement to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, who is a former Black Panther, was on death row, still incarcerated. Um, And then, you know, the global justice movement, so-called anti-globalization movement. And then I was like in the anarchist movement, wing of those movements. And then I was... From there, I ended up getting involved and doing some support work for 
political prisoners who were, many of whom were formerly incar- were incarcerated former guerrillas who had been in groups like the Weather Underground or the Black Liberation Army. And I visited some of them in prison and wrote to them and tried to do some other support work. So I went back to school later. I dropped out. Of, I went to Southern Connecticut State University um, mm-hmm. after high school because it was like the coolest place in Connecticut. You know, New Haven seemed like the coolest place in Connecticut. So <laughs> uh, better than Danbury or New Britain. Um, so I went, I dropped out of there because I, after the battle of Seattle, actually in 1999, yeah. I, and, um, actually drove across the country with some friends to Eugene, the eco anarchist capital, but didn't get caught up in stuff too much there. Eugene, but anyway, Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. yeah. Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. It was kind of like the 1990s version of like the Oregon trail or something. I realize now, now that I teach PNW history, but anyway, um, <laughs> I was going to say, that's like, a, you're like a, ni- a veteran of 90s left politics because, yeah, Eugene, Oregon. I, I mean, we used to call it the yeah. Hidby Highway actually this way, coming up from like LA and San Francisco, oh. going up to going up to Oregon, going up to Washington. That way was well traveled by the sorts of people you're you're talking about. Totally. Yeah. When they when they when the Weather Underground kidnapped um, Timothy Leary, I think they took him up this way um, <laughs> when they got I mean, sorry, kidnapped. They released them from prison you yeah. know they yeah, sprung let's, them let's, from prison and, yeah let's get the revolutionary we'll come, terminology yeah. right yeah <laughs> yeah sorry sorry <laughs> i just um so anyway yeah i got involved in all, I, you know i was in you know i ended up back in maine and then we lot um to to cut through this story a little quicker i i ended up going back to school at university of southern maine and um I wanted to, I would decide to get a degree in history. Part of it, I want to kind of process some of the movements I've been a part of. And um, I was kind of reaching a period of a little bit of, of burnout. The green scare happened actually. So you had all these, um, this roundup in two, late 2005, um, early 2006 of a bunch of people who actually had been in Eugene. You know, fortunately I didn't get caught up in that stuff, but a bunch of them had been in Eugene had been involved in political arsons carried out in the name of the Earth Liberation Front. So there's this crackdown on all these people and a lot of them turned into informants. I mean, they were mm-hmm. facing your, like life in prison sometimes, but, and being called terrorists. And so, and that, so that was a part of like a, a burnout piece for me as I was like, oh my God, what's happening to this movement I thought I was part of. Mm. So anyway, when I went back to school, I started, I was interested in studying some of these leftist guerrilla movements. And there was one that came out of a group that was in Maine that was actually like a group of white, ex-convicts and working class Vietnam veterans who like work modeled partly off the Black Panthers. And I, I wrote an undergraduate thesis on them and they're called SCAR, Statewide Correct, um, Statewide Correctional Alliance for Reform. And I wrote a master's thesis about them too when I went to UMass. But I knew I wanted to keep researching these guerrilla groups. Um, and and I know they're in the literature and the memoirs and stuff like that, there's plenty of explanation for why some people of fringe in the radical left decided to go that they wanted to follow Che Guevara and carry out bombings as a way to end the war in Vietnam and end racist violence by Mm -hmm. police and black Mm -hmm. communities. But I wanted, I was interested in the question of, well, how did these, these, these bombings and whatnot, you know, over 600 carried out during the Nixon era, era by a conservative estimate, plus other attacks, assassinations of police officers and stuff. Um, how did this influence politics beyond the radical left? And how did it influence the FBI and the FBI's um, national security, you know, efforts? Yeah. And, and, and that's what led me, you know, to digging through old FBI documents in various forms, microfilms and, and various archives, the Nixon Presidential Library, and then um, coming to the looking at the origins of counterterrorism. What a great question, because it's, it's, you know, for a long time, especially when I was younger, you know, I hearing about the Weather Underground and hearing about mm. uh, radicals and watching Weather Underground documentaries, um, I, I, I was definitely like wide eyed young guy looking at that stuff thinking these are heroes you know and i kind of i had like one sort of way of looking at it um and i love that question of sort of like what are the side effects of this like what are the what are like the lasting legacies of that because that question is something that i come back to a lot i mean it's sort of easy to imagine the 60s if you get into the the mindset of the vietnam anti-war movement and the movement against racism in america you can see the logical endpoint is sort of like eventually someone's going to say we need to blow some shit up um, and that's what the, that's what yeah. where the narrative ends up. 
But the relationship yeah. between the, 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 those groups and law enforcement is so like, it seems really porous. Like there's like, I mean, it's in my book too. Like the, at the coffee houses, they're making announcements that like, if you're FBI, like, let us know, you know, like there's just like sort of <laughs> yeah. this feeling in the movement that we're already infiltrated. And that to yeah. me is just like leads to this whole like paranoid world. Yeah, totally. And DVAW becomes Vietnam Veterans Against the War becomes a big target. And, you know, as you know, in like 70, I think around 72, 1972. They were doing big stuff, though. I mean, they were like, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like dropping banners over the on the Statue of Liberty, some really like big public events that were sort of had a disturbing tone to them, honestly, like the, the yeah. war come home in a really dark, uh, scary, even almost threatening way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I just, it just got me thinking about th thinking about that, but uh, okay. So we backing up, I, I started <laughs> thinking about that and started <laughs> asking, forgetting the first part of the question. It was, um, the relationship between the FBI and, the oh yeah. 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 Well, there's a lot of mythology around it. Okay. Right. So, uh, or like, that's another thing that kind of animated me. So let, let me just use this podcast as a cathartic moment to say that like Ward Churchill's book, people should just stop citing it. Like, please, for love of God, it's just not a accurate, like his two books with Jim Vanderwall, Agents of Repression and um, the COINTELPRO papers. Very, very, you know, the COINTELPRO papers that these repeat, like print the documents, but misrepresent them, take them out of context misrepresenting other people's to work what purpose what is cited. what what is ward churchill doing that for because that's a name i haven't thought about for a while i mean <laughs> okay. i remember him as sort of like a a, a really you know controversial figure when 9 11 mm. happened because he's like made the like little eichmann's comment but yeah but i know that yeah. he's been a sort of like radical figure in academia and outside of academia for a while yeah so I'll, you know, I don't want to make the, make the whole th thing just about him, but right. the, the, I, I brought it up as a, as a foil because that book really circulated in the movements I was in to show like, you know, and you know, the thing he argument, he argues is like all of this shows that like, if you try to challenge the state in any way, you're going to be targeted by the FBI, if not for like neutralization and like assassination. Mm. And it makes mm -hmm. it like sound as though like, the state is just all powerful and there's nothing one can do except maybe commit revolutionary suicide, like just go down, Jesus, you know, yeah. shooting, you know, that's kind of, the, that's kind of where it goes. And, you know, he's, um, there's someone else writing a book kind of about his, like some of his kind of sketchier background, but like it definitely, you know, when that investigation at university of um, Colorado Boulder of mm -hmm. his work, because he wrote that screed that kind of got the attention it might have been even David Horowitz. Somebody yeah. on the right found yep. it, and I, yeah, and um, and it, you know, they found like that there there was like problems in his in his in his work about Native American history, but mm -hmm. you know they didn't even look at those two books, and they're they're full of problems. But yeah, I, I could remember, go. I, could I remember keep remembering all of this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, the so there's a lot of there's a lot of myths. I mean, there's this idea that like. That, that's just one of them, what I just said, like, and that political repression is just a reflection of the effectiveness of the group that's being targeted in challenging the status quo, like that's another myth. And then people also kind of like, don't understand the difference between surveillance and passive surveillance and counterintelligence, and also the difference between an informant and an undercover officer. You know, mm -hmm. those are different things. Right. And they, those things. And, and then, and then also that there's multiple law enforcement and intelligence agencies at play in this history that are doing different things. But um, so, I mean, there's a lot I, more I could say about that, but I think what I show is change over time yeah. and context. Right. And that one of the, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is J. Edgar Hoover right? Who runs the FBI from 1924 till 1972, almost half a century. And he builds it up as this powerful autonomous institution, um, of, uh, you know, with limited oversight from the executive or congressional mm -hmm. um, branches. He, he actually, in the mid sixties, he cuts back on a lot of the illegal surveillance tactics he had been using against the communist party earlier on in the 50s and early 60s, like break-ins that also known as black bag jobs, um, warrantless wiretapping, mail opening and mail surveillance, also use of um, informants under the age of 21. He, mm -hmm. he, he made the limit up to, to uh, from 18 to 21. So he did all of this stuff in the mid 60s because he was getting old and 
he, in the period of rising protests, he was worried about leaks. And one of part of what gave him his power was projecting this image of the mighty G man protecting America from America's national security and fighting crime, these swashbuckling, you know, young men with clear, clean cut hairdos and stuff. (laughs) So, you know, (laughs) so, but he was worried about leaks and it's after some of these bomb, these bombings pick up, there's a, there's pressure from the Nixon administration. There's, there's a, a, an internal conflict within the FBI, including um, some dissent from William Sullivan, who ran the counterintelligence programs, which are another thing I can talk about. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it's after these bombings that he starts bringing back some of these surveillance tactics and doing it actually um, at first initially on an at on a what's it called an informal basis mm-hmm. like you know where he's giving kind of a, a wink and a nod and maybe verbal messages only nothing on nothing in writing to just have people start going after doing break-ins to, to try to find the weather underground so this is where we get the origins of pre you know preemptive policing tactics to preempt what they start calling terrorism you know, as well as developing some new tactics. You know, I mentioned undercover agents. Actually, the FBI doesn't institute an undercover agent program until 1972 after Hoover's death. And it's to go. They actually infiltrate, as you know, um, VVAW. Right. And, you know, but they also they're going after um, trying to find the weather underground. Is it? So is, it's new tactics and we're bringing back old tactics. And I can talk more about COINTELPRO, but like yeah. that's the kind of timeline I'm looking at in the origins of counterterrorism. It's, I mean, it's such an important story because, I mean, I want to I want to understand and I want everyone listening to understand sort of how does the FBI evolve because of these because of this moment, this like Nixon moment, because what we all heard, I mean, it was a couple years ago. I think it's been it's a it's a quote that's been circulated a lot. Is it from Haldeman? I think it's from it's one of those figures who says, well, we had two major enemies in in uh, in the United States, domestic enemies, and they were white radicals and black radicals, basically, and we knew we could go after them with drugs, right? People took that quote to be like, well, the war on drugs was entirely a constructed sort of apparatus yeah. to go after the radical, the black and white radicals of the 1960s. How much of that is connected to what we're, we're talking about here? Yeah, well, the... Nixon goes, tries to really crack down on radicals as soon as he comes into office. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in fact, you know, I'm talking the first chapter of my book, a lot of people don't know this, like the first like leftist, rad, like leftist radical on the FBI's most wanted list he's, is this guy um, named um, Cameron Bishop, who blows up with three other people, um, utility towers in, in Denver on, on Nixon's inauguration day. And, and cuts out um, power to a Dow, um, I'm sorry, a Coors plant that's that's building um, nose cones for Sidewinder missiles. So, so, but anyway, the, um, so, but Nixon comes in wanting to crack down on all his enemies and, 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 and on dissidents. You know, he has his attorney general, John Mitchell, um, indict the Chicago Eight for their actions for the, you know, trying to blame the violence. It was mostly police violence at the 68 Democratic Convention on these protesters, but he also asked J. Edgar Hoover to to find evidence that the pan that like the the, the the civil disturbances, the rebellions or riots in the big cities of, throughout the '60s, and that the Black Power movement and the student the anti-war movement, the New Left, find he wants Nixon wants Hoover to find evidence that these are being funded by a foreign government like Cuba or People's Republic of China, and you know he's still in his mindset of this you know, um, cold warrior, anti-communist who'd cut his teeth, um, you know, you know, paving the way for McCarthy back you in the late 40s. found that a lot, even in like the, the later, like HUAC um, uh, uh, testimony. And uh, the, 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 in, in, those, in those meetings, the, the, the older generation is of senators and, and intelligence figures are all sort of like, well, where's the connection to the Soviet Union? Where, you know, they want yeah. all that. They're, they sort of have a very old fashioned, um, sort of understanding of how the left works in America. Yeah, yeah. So he's still coming in with that, and 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 actually, Hoover is saying to Nixon, "We don't have evidence of this. There's no evidence. This is this is homegrown stuff. I mean, they might be ideologically informed by ideas or tactics, but um, there's no there's no evidence. So there is like 
who like Nixon kind of expected Hoover, who shared a lot of the same politics and they had worked together during the second Red Scare, the McCarthy era, like to kind of just like cooperate and do what he's told. And, and right away, Hoover is saying, well, no, we don't have this 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 evidence. And that, so there's already tension there. Mm. Um, and but but meanwhile, there's also the counterintelligence programs going on. And Cointel here's Pro. another Cointel Pro. Okay, yeah. and here's where there's some more mythology, and this is a sensitive topic. Mm-hmm. But people, t- Cointel Pro was not just one program. There was as many as twelve domestic counterintelligence programs. Most, um, a few of them were anti espionage. Um, there was uh, like five major ones going after the left. You know, Communist Party, Socialist Workers Party, Puerto Rican Nationalists. That was in the earlier mm-hmm. part of the Cold War, and then later you have going after the new left and the black power movement. Then you also had one going after white supremacist groups in the Klan that actually combined with um, like, you know, prosecution and other law enforcement measures was actually pretty effective in breaking up the Klan down mm-hmm. in the South. Mm-hmm. After, after 1964 and the, when the three civil rights workers were killed in, in Mississippi, you know, and, and Johnson gets on the phone with, with um, Hoover and says, you gotta do something about the Klan. You know, Hoover yeah. let the Klan do whatever they wanted pretty much before that he said it's a but anyway jesus so yeah so anyway there's multiple and and counterintelligence is information counter pro is information warfare like spreading false information to divide people and in some place cases it leads to violence and people getting killed especially with the panthers so that's the ucla yeah. murders right like that's one of the, one of those that, yeah. that's one of them yeah yeah um but that's i talk about in the book and, it, and i'm very careful with how i talk about that one but um, wait, let me just come back to that. Real yeah, quick. sorry, I, I keep say, bringing no. up the, the complications to your story. No, yeah. it's okay. We can keep going there. But um, so the, the what's well, you know, it's what those who know something about COINTELPRO Pro know that like the most know of, and, and maybe you've seen the movie Judas and the Black Messiah, right? Know about some of the most kind of like uh, crazy stuff that yeah, that yeah. Hoover and the FBI leaders say in these initial COINTELPRO documents going after the black power movement. Yeah, they say we wanna, um, in 1967, when they're starting this program, we wanna prevent the rise of a black messiah that can unite the black movement. But it also, but what, what has been kind of downplayed or even not discussed in a lot, including in Churchill's work, but that is so widely cited in the rest of the literature is that what Hoover is also saying in these documents that were never meant to see the light of day outside of the FBI. Well, they, they also say we, we, what we're trying to do here is preemptively destroy groups that are advocating violence against police officers mm. and, and or other forms of civil disorder. And, and initially they're trying to preempt groups that might, that they, there's a crisis already created in the Johnson administration by all the urban uprisings. And, and, and because Johnson's just trying to deal with crisis management from this, he's telling Hoover, you gotta, like, you gotta find, you gotta find some way to prevent these from happening in advance. And there's a, this thing called a ghetto informant program where they're trying to get informants in every black urban neighborhood in the country. And it's total, doesn't do anything. In fact, there's even fake informants because the FBI feels under pressure to like make reports every month. Um, but they also, the COINTEL pros again, for, are, are really just the main focus is to try to like destroy groups who are advocating killing police officers. Mm. And so it's pretty, they mention Martin Luther King in there. They say like, oh, if he switches, moves away from nonviolence, he could be a target. But um, he had been targeted with a couple kind of ad hoc COINTEL pro operations earlier. You, people might know about William Sullivan and Hoover approved of this, sending him a letter telling him to commit suicide. And it's pretty famous sending, one, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a famous one. But that happens earlier. And he actually, that, that was uh, 60, late 64, early 65. In 65, he starts cutting back on those operations mm-hmm. against mm-hmm. against King. So when, so what I, I, in the opening chapters of the book, I'm tracing both the origins of this kind of guerrilla turn um, in, in the radical left, you know, borrowing from Vijay Prashad, I call it the cult, cult of the gun. But it's look, tracing kind of focal theory, this, this, this theory for guerrilla warfare that comes from Che Guevara and Regis Debre and others in Latin America. I trace that while at the same time tracing the development of preemptive surveillance by the FBI and, and their, their work with other law enforcement agencies. And one of the things I look at that's, just, that's kind of sad and depressing is that a lot of those counterintelligence operations 
they didn't create, sometimes they tried to create new conflicts. Like they tried that in Chicago mm-hmm. with Fred Hampton and the Blackstone Rangers. And you actually, the, the film Judas and the Black Messiah and the Black Messiah, although it makes Hoover's character look like a cartoon villain that was really unnecessary. Like that part about with Fred Hampton, the Blackstone Rangers and, and Fred Hampton de-escalating the situation is pretty accurate. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the, the fractures that they, they exacerbate are already there. And they make they take a conflict that are already there and try to make it worse. So, like the conflicts that you mentioned on UCLA, is um, is one of those where there's already like serious conflict between um, us, United Slaves, which is a, a cultural nationalist black organization, and the Black Panthers, who consider themselves revolutionary nationalists, and they are two among many other black nationalist groups that are part of like a rich kind of movement and scene in Los Angeles. And so, and, and the way that that's been, so there's no, yeah. So Hmm. there's not evidence that that was like a direct hit. Like, I mean, they they, they, they tried, they tried to exacerbate tensions and they, they were glad to let see, to get, see black radicals kill each other. But the way that that's been portrayed, even going from the Panther newspaper at that time was the fascist state, is is targeting us all because we're so effective in challenging the status quo and really you know it's a much more complicated yep. story yeah. about you know people picking up the guns to defend themselves and to go on the offensive i talk about some of that too there was the panther underground was already assassinating some police officers right is in um as, um, after the, the Detroit and Newark uprisings in 1967, there's actions in, in San Francisco that so, are happening. So, so it's, cur- it's asymmetrical, but it's the, the, gun, the bullets are going both ways. Yeah, I'm curious about that, the cult of the gun and, uh, and, and where that comes from. I, I love that idea. I mean, I don't know if I love that idea, but uh, <laughs> um, I, love, I love the idea of kind of interrogating where the, where the impulse comes from. Because, you know, it, it seems like it's very easy. I, I, I also like the idea that you're breaking up some, some sort of like binaries or mythologies here of like a heroic left that's being crushed by a fascist state. There's sort of something more complicated going on. That indicates a little bit of of where where we head afterwards, and what the attitude of all, you know the state is towards uh, um, uh, revolutionary violence and militia groups and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. Because you know we get into in this program a lot. We're talking about the '90s when militia violence was coming from the right, and it seemed like the FBI was at war with them. I mean, I mean Clinton's mm-hmm. FBI was. That was that was uh, Ruby Ridge and all that um, Waco yeah. too, right? Leading to the Oklahoma City bombing. I mean, it's dramatic shit, and we don't have to yeah. talk. About, we don't have to talk about all that stuff. Um, but I, 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 I'm interested in sort of like the how the left is like associated with social polit- political violence in the '60s, and and the, this FBI is built up. Um, and then where that where that energy goes afterwards, I guess. But maybe yeah. maybe we can start with where the cult of the gun comes from. What wh- what groups are you know? How does that how does violence enter into these groups? I know it's sort of a diverse set of circumstances, probably. But by by probably yeah. 1968 and 69, you're seeing a lot more of this stuff. Yeah, and I yeah, and I do trace that in the book. So um, there's a couple things causes for this. One is state violence. Okay. People are, the the war in Vietnam is escalating. People are sitting in, they're doing all the things you're supposed to do in a liberal democracy to supposedly be able to create change. And their country is still bombing the people of Southeast Asia. And, you know, it's 3 million people dead, as you know, by the time the war is over. And Nixon just escalates it, even though he says he's running with a secret plan to end it. Um, so, so there's, so there's that, and then just the rampant problem of police violence against protesters, and then you know working class people, and of course disproportionately in in urban black communities. Mm-hmm. So, so there's that, and then and um, so there's that, and then there's a strategy coming out of Latin America. You know this, and you 1966 is the tri cannot Continental Congress in Havana and Che Guevara sends his letter from East Africa um, where he calls for one too many Vietnams and people and the, 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 the success of the guerrillas in South in South Vietnam and like bogging down the most powerful military that's ever existed using inferior weapons and guerrilla tactics is also an inspiration and the um, 
So that, that makes sense, actually, because they, you know yeah. the criticism would be like, how the fuck are you going to wage a guerrilla war against the American government on the soy on United States soil? I mean, you, you see that the, that the government, what they have, you know, you see what they're doing in Vietnam. But then mm -hmm. there's this other side of it that's like, no, but like the people rising up from below um, those stories of the v of the Viet Cong wearing flip flops um, and, yeah, bogging down the, the, the greatest imperial army in in, in human history is something that, that definitely probably distorted the left's sort of vision of what was possible. Yeah. And I think for some, you know, there's some people who said like doing this guerrilla stuff is crazy and I didn't get into that as much, but yeah. they're, they're like, you're going to just, it's just going to lead to more, it's just going to play into Nixon's law and order politics. And, you know, I, I try in the book to like both human, like humanize and explain why people to really take seriously, why people, thought that embracing FOCO theory and guerrilla, urban guerrilla warfare like was a strategy or was a way to like maintain a commitment to a revolutionary change. And um, while at the same time, and this, this required me to, pro to confront my own earlier romanticization of, of some of these movements, mm -hmm. but like to look critically at how those actions played into the, these conflicts that that contribute to the rise of the right and the there is I'm not blaming it on the left as guerrillas mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the punitive this punitive turn toward away from social democracy of the New Deal and the Great Society towards mass incarceration and um, and the right emerges with much more organized political power than the left by the 70s and 80s like this was a this was a turning point here so. So yeah, I'm looking at all. I'm trying to. I'm trying to look at, in a sophisticated way at, at that. But yeah, so the cult of the gun. It, yeah, so there's this. There's a, the state violence, and then there's a strategy being offered that some people in the U.S. say, "All right, maybe we can. We, if we can help with the Vietnamese, and we can help people in Latin America, you know, by just like, you know, if the U.S. is the head of the octopus, maybe we can blow that up and take the whole thing down." But <laughs> right. Um, you know, it, it, so, it seems yeah. like a, it comes from a combination of things. I mean, it comes from you mentioned like a frustration of like nothing changing you, with all yeah. the tool with all the tools of liberal democracy and all the protests and all the, um, you know, nonviolent civil disobedience seem like it had reached its end point, at least for some people, you know, and then. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the reaction part is interesting. I, I'm thinking about Attica in 71, mm -hmm. too. Right. Because, you know, what you're describing here sort of like. I think a lot of people don't understand that there was like it's it's actually in the eyes on the prize documentary. I think mm. Amiri, Amiri Baraka makes the point that a lot of revolutionary people were looking to the population of incarcerated people as like that's totally. the, that's the revolutionary population. And like Attica yeah. seems like it was just I mean, I, we had Heather Ann Thompson who wrote a book about Attica come in. Yep fucking nuts dude and it seems like a moment <laughs> to, to put it lightly that's my that's that's my yeah. these days. it's fucking crazy man but it is and it, seems, <laughs> and it seems like a really important moment in like um in in everything you're talking about because there's an image mm -hmm. in in heather ann thompson's book of you know there was this standoff in attica with like these uh with the guards that are you know taken hostage and and the prisoners are in there and people are outside and they're freaking out and the families of these people show up. So the families of the officers and the law enforcement shows up alongside the families of all the people who are incarcerated. And they're looking at each other like real ugly, you know, like there's this sort of like all of a sudden you see this sort of like all these like white upstate people who are kind of connected to law enforcement and all the like black and Puerto Rican people who are connected to these people who are more or less swept up from New York City and thrown into Attica. And that social... That social difference is intense. It made me think a lot about sort of like what was going on um, in yeah. the 60s and, and how that moment is sort of indicative of where a lot of energy goes, right? I'm thinking about Blue Lives Matter and sort of like the hard yeah. identification with law enforcement, et cetera. For sure. Yeah, you know, and I talk about Attica in the book and I even quote, um, not only cite, but quote Heather Ann Thompson in there because she has a really good quote um, about that shift, you know, about how people after Attica many people, particularly many, a growing number of white people are, you know, associate the kind of uprising there. And, 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 you know, they're told by the media that the, the, that the hostages were killed, it's the, a the guards taken hostage. Yeah. yeah, it was a lie, but they, they were, they were killed by the crossfire of the, uh, of the state police and the, 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 who went in and opened fire. And they were also told that the, 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 
the prisoners had castrated. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. all these lies, people watching on TV. So there's a shift of people, yeah, associating like the urban uprisings and the violence with 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 black people and you know people like reagan and uh, you know play into that with all the dog whistle politics but yeah but in terms of the this leftist guerrilla struggle yeah i mean th- th- that that was that was for those who were already de- like experiencing and witnessing police violence and following the war in vietnam and trying to change things and seeing people just get tear gas and beat up by the cops and still s- wanting to keep maintain a commitment to revolutionary struggle that was just confirmation that the state's going to stop at nothing to kill people i mean nixon even called up um rockefeller the 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 governor of new york and was like you did the right thing you like killing all those people he didn't care about law he didn't care about law he cared about order right Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. which meant caring about he he stopping certain kind of violence if it was left as guerrillas but using the violence of the state and the military abroad to try to maintain a certain political order that 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 um he was invested in so anyway th- yeah there's a bunch of bombings carried out after attica that inspired more bombings um you know in retaliation like um i think the weather underground bombed the correctional uh, um state correctional offices in albany and there and there was a ta- an attack by the bla uh, uh, of a police cruiser in new york I think they even had a grenade. They rolled a grenade under a cop car. How how does this era slow down? Yes. How how in other words, because we know that the, mm. the, the 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 era of political violence we're talking about, the weather underground, where you, you, and it's not, yeah. not just weather underground. We're talking like six hundred bombings in a year. Like this yeah. is the kind of shit you tell people, and they're like, "What?" Like young people, especially, are like, "What are you talking about?" But it goes away. It's an era that. So does the FBI yeah. take that as a success? Like we did the right thing and we broke it up. Well, it actually goes on. So in terms of like the mass protest element of this, that, you know, this guy, Lawrence Roberts wrote a book, May Day 1971. That was the, like the big protests on May Day 1971. I've got it back here somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I see it. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. We're on Zoom. The people listening don't know that. But anyway, um, the that you know, that was a big protest in New York. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I think it was the last, maybe one of the last, like, big protests. But actually, this guerrilla act. You're talking about the Days coming... of Rage? Is that no, what you're talking about? no, no, that's, I'm talking that's about, D.C., sorry. Yeah, this yeah. is in D.C. after that, and it's, okay. it was kind of less known, and he wrote this book. Yeah, and, like, and there was a mass, pro- there was a mass arrest of protesters, like, thousands, the lar- largest mass arrest in U.S. history. Um, but anyway... But the bombings actually continue and there's like kind of new waves of guerrilla bombers that go all the way into the early 80s from the left. There's the um, Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional, the FALN, Puerto Rican Independence um, Group that are more com- more diaspora Puerto Rican leftists coming out of the U.S. But And then there's also a Machateros in Puerto Rico. There's um, United Freedom Front Group um, that's an anti-imperialist in the Northeast. So, and whether remnant the VLA has different w- kind of reincarnations, and then there's an, a, a, um, another white anti-imperialist group that's doing stuff in New York into the mm-hmm. early '80s. So that so, but but they're smaller and smaller groups of people with better security carrying out more bombings. Is sort of what happens. But I guess what the, so, but in terms of that winding down, like some of it is because what, what part of what I talk about is that the these counterterrorism tactics that are developed. And there's also new like federal institutions dedicated to combating terrorism that are developed in the Nixon administration, although they're, they're weak and I can come back to that, but it's really limited in effectiveness and sometimes even has unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences is a bureaucratic conflict within the FBI and between Hoover's FBI and Nixon that leads to the Watergate scandal. Mm. So like that's part of the, my uh, intervention in my book, like the weather underground didn't create a revolution, but indirectly they brought down Nixon. And that's a, a story of Watergate <laughs> that hasn't been told. Um, um, and but they, they also Nixon, helped bring about counterterrorism. Say that again. So the, 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 the bureaucratic sort of infighting going on over the weather gra- underground is, is, is part of, I mean, I, I feel like I'm because, I, I, you know, reading like Rick, per, like like a Rick Perlstein about Nixon. Mm-hmm. Right. And the and the sort of like pop treatment that he gives it. I still had the feeling that like, oh, shit, like part of what happened with Watergate is like a bunch of different a bunch of different like independent groups are sort of working on their own. And like there's even that moment 
when I think one of the trippier moments I've, I've heard about Nixon, and maybe you can respond yeah. to this sort of like is 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 when um, George Wallace is shot, and mm. like um, Nixon is immediately sort of like panicked, like is this us? Is this one of our projects? Like is this you know so someone that's like part of our plumbers group? involved in this at all because we're doing all sorts of weird rat fucking shit all over the place and there was a um there was a sort of group of dudes that were dispatched to the apartment of the guy that shot george wallace who were going to try to plant some left-wing literature so that it would look like someone that was uh not on their team that had been a part of this and they never got there apparently they got the police got to the apartment first they weren't able to plant that stuff but to me it sort of indicated a little bit of this like the idea like we don't even know what the fuck is going on there are like all these little projects of people working on things all over the place um and they might conflict does that does that picture make sense at all yeah that's part of it you know and, and like i i you know i i've I, I need to go back to the Wallace thing. I've like, I, I don't cover that in the book, but I cover a lot of other stuff. And um, <laughs> the, you know, cause Watergate is not just about the response to leftist guerrillas. It's also about stopping leaks. I mean, one, another point of tension between um, even before the Pentagon papers come out in, in, in June, 1971, Daniel Ellsberg releasing this big report on the Vietnam war. And, the, and I'll come back to that. Another leak, there's a series of leaks um, I think it's 1969, um, where of, of leaks, from, we don't know where, coming from the State Department or somewhere else, um, exposing information about Kissinger's expansion of the war in Vietnam into Cambodia. That's right. Secretly. Yep. Yep. And, and there's a whole set of wiretaps known as the Kissinger wiretaps that Hoover keeps, tries to keep in a, se a secret location in his interior office outside of the normal filing program. And cause, and he, cause he wanted to make sure the paper trail led back to Nixon and not to him for these illegal wiretaps. So that was another point of contention early on. But what happens is um, the, in, in March, 1970, three members of the weather underground accidentally blow themselves up in this townhouse in Greenwich village where they're building bombs that they're going to use to carry to bomb a dance for non-commissioned officers at Fort Dix in New Jersey. And that creates, um, it, it later creates a reckoning within the weather underground and they avoid going after some, like human targets with their bombings. Um, and, you know, but also the, for the, for the FBI that, well, they're like, Oh man, these people are talking about bringing the war home. Like this is a serious thing. And Nick and Nixon's putting the pressure on to like use these are legal tactics, stop this stuff from happening. Mm -hmm. What happened? That's when he starts doing some of the, the authorizing first in New York, some of these break-ins on this unofficial basis, like to try to go after the weather underground. But also what happens is this guy, Tom Houston, who instant, interestingly enough had been the head of, young Americans for freedom while he was in graduate school in Indiana, but becomes a, and work the he, Buckley he's, he's a, conservative group for those that he, don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in, he is a staffer, a young staffer for Nixon and he get be, be friends, William Sullivan, who's head of the domestic security division in the FBI. And Houston, Houston is sent by Nixon to like get Hoover to cooperate more with the FBI. And he talks to Sullivan and Sullivan says, you know, and Sullivan also has like, he wants to become Hoover's successor as a head of the FBI, but they, and all these guys know how to play the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. except Houston's a little young. He doesn't quite get it. Um, and he gets, he, um, but anyway, Sullivan basically convinces Houston that Hoover is stuck in this old, old, like, like, um, dated concern about the communist party and not doing enough to respond to this guerrilla bombings. And when the, that, that townhouse bombing happens, it kind of a confirmation of that. And that leads to Houston drawing up this secret plan that becomes known as the Houston plan after it's uncovered after what, and during the Watergate hearings, where it was, the, this was a secret plan that was going to consolidate all of the federal intelligence agencies, the national security Agency, central intelligence agency, the defense intelligence agency, and the FBI, all under the command of the White House, underneath with like as like a what you know uh, a White House intelligence agency, and then it was going to um, um, also bring back all those illegal surveillance tactics like break-ins on an official basis. And long story short, you know Nixon verbally passes it because he doesn't want his name on it, and Hoover torpedoes it because he he also doesn't want he doesn't want to be under the command of the white house. He still wants his autonomy and his jurisdictional turf. And then he's also, um, you know, 
does you know does he, he's concerned also that Nick's that he doesn't want the FBI it leaks that the FBI is involved in these kind of tactics. So mm-hmm. he ends up going through Attorney General Mitchell and con- and Mitchell con- convinces Nixon to back out of this. But that really turns this simmering conflict into like a full full on um, full on bureaucratic conflict. And there's a couple other more fl- other flashpoints like Jonathan uh, like. A few months, a couple months later, Jonathan Jackson, the young black radical, tries to take, um, carries out an armed raid on a courthouse in Marin County, California. Then you have a couple of young white anti-war radicals in Madison set off a bomb at University of Wisconsin um, to at a at a, a place that's doing weapons research, and they accidentally kill a postdoctoral physics researcher. Mm. Like those, that's another flashpoint. And then, and um, the BLA emerging in May 1971, assassinating police officers is another flashpoint. But what happens then when the Pentagon papers get leaked, Daniel Ellsberg, he worked for the Rand Corporation, um, has a crisis of consciousness, conscious, leaks this big report showing that all the, gov- all the presidents from Truman to Johnson had lied about the war in Vietnam. Nixon's concerned that there's gonna be more info that's gonna make him look bad. He asked Hoover to like, go hard after Ellsberg and, and Hoover kind of draws a line, you know, he's like, you know, I'm willing to, he doesn't say it out loud. Of course, he's very (laughs) careful, but basically what he's, what he's saying through innuendo and whatnot is that I'm not going to go like, I'll go after the, the, these people we're starting to call terrorists, these revolutionaries, leftist bombers using these, these illegal tactics, but I'm not going to do it for Ellsberg. And that's when Nixon forms his own. He's like, I can't rely on the FBI to do my dirty work. I'm going to create my own group of people. And that's the plumbers. And that's, ah, that makes you know, so much sense. That makes yeah. so clear to me. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, so that's that, you know, that's where, it, you know, we get into Watergate and then, you know, I also talk about Mark Felt who he deep throat, right? The, yeah. Deep throat. Yeah. So he's leaking. If he's doing a counterintelligence operation against Nixon and also L Patrick gray, who's Nixon stooge, who he, who, felt really resents um, Nixon putting into the head of the FBI after May 1972 when, when Hoover dies. And he's the number two guy. And he had been put there by uh, Hoover at the end of his life to try to control Sullivan. So there's all this bureaucratic maneuvering. Um, Felt is pro-Hoover or Hoover loyalist and shares his ideals, but also agrees that we, they need to... Um, officially bring back the break-ins to go after the weather underground and stuff. But basically he tries to, he starts formally reauthorizing those break-ins while at the same time doing a counterintelligence operation against Nixon wow. and Gray yeah. and exposing the FBI information from the FBI's Watergate investigation. And then it all comes down on all of that. You know, it comes down on Nixon, L. Patrick Gray's career ends like, and then, and then they, um, Gray's acting um, successor, William Ruckelshaus um, ends up firing Felt, and then you know, and then um, and then Felt later, and Edward Miller, who worked with him, are later indicted and convicted for authorizing the Weather Underground mm. um, break-ins. But right. then Reagan pardons him and says wow. he pardons them because they were freedom, they were they were protecting the country from terrorism. Right? It's the Reagan Revolution, and the right is back, and counterterrorism is like now this tool of the right. So. Um, what a story. And, and but yeah, it's, yeah. what's interesting what's in, interesting to me like sort of like the coda to the story. And I recommend mm-hmm. everyone check out your book because I think what you're doing is sort of intervening on a lot of orthodoxy and 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 sort of um stories that we've told too many times I and mean, they've become sort of like um the 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 standard stories when there's something a lot more complicated. And to me mm-hmm. like I I mean I don't know what you th- what you think about all like January 6th and everything like mm-hmm. that but it seems like there's 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 this sort of uh, the cult of the gun is on the right in some ways <laughs> right um i don't i don't know how far we'll yeah. go in, we'll go into that yeah. but it's, i mean it's just really really interesting in the context you're explaining like the sort of right wing nixon wanting to use you know all the power of the state to come down on these left wing groups when they're you know j- just the other day like obama is coming out and saying like oh we need to like you know, we need to like make sure that there's no misinformation, disinformation online, and we need to control all that information. It's sort of, mm. to me, it's sort of very, very interesting to me to see how all the all how all those things shift and where where the state will be when there's right wing violence. Yeah, it's we're, it's all pretty weird, but <laughs> yeah, I talk um, I talk about that in the, in the epilogue. Yeah, so I mean, 
I mean, there's so much to say about that. I guess the, the brief, the first thing to say is that, you know, the, the, with Trump, like, you know, trying to like these conspiracies, blaming so-called Antifa as, mm -hmm. as terrorists and stuff towards the end of his administration. But then like the party, the Republican party now, that's supposed to be the party of law and order and fighting terrorism, right? These are two of main, Trump's main things that he was all about, that he took, borrowed from Nixon, you know, on behalf of, and borrowed from Nixon and Reagan on behalf of making America great again and protecting the so-called silent majority. Like, like that's a joke now. Like what does terrorism yeah. right. and law and order even mean when the whole Republican party pretty much just backs up Trump for, um, mm -hmm. you know, two impeachments and we can come back to the first one, but for the second yeah. one for, yeah, inciting people to charge a freaking capital and some of them had guns and were trying to even hang his vice president going after cops like, too which is really yeah, interesting to cops, me. Like, aren't these the shit out of cops yeah, yeah. this like the blue lives matter people yeah. it's really, i know yeah. i know crazy so so and then there's yeah there's interesting conspiracy like a newer in conspiracy theory is that some of the is like even like ted cruz were, were saying publicly that um, Garland, the attorney, current attorney general, had called parent groups that are that are concerned about masks and criti so-called critical race theory in in, in K through twelve schools. That Gar Garland had called some of them terrorists, and that's a complete misrepresentation of this report that Garland had cited. But he didn't use that term, mm. and that's that's been like churning through you know i get my google alerts for counterterrorism and all yeah. these right-wing websites keep coming up with like garland calls parents terrorists you know so there's this way now in which um the fbi has been really i mean the fbi has never recovered from being delegitimized like hoover's worst nightmares came true in terms of like these these actions backfiring and being exposed and being leaked mm -hmm. and you can talk about the me the media pennsylvania burglary that made it happen that i also mm -hmm. write about and the mm -hmm. paranoia that also spreads in the left but so it's interesting that you know the fbi has never gotten over that in terms of the reputation but it's so interesting to see them attack from the right now and even though some liberals and you know like really almost like weirdly romanticizing the fbi including um what's his name uh what um Mueller yeah, yeah that's right Mueller, yeah who cut oh, his yeah. teeth going after leftist guerrillas actually in the that whole yeah. that whole coda yeah. to, I mean one of yeah. the things the, the the whole reason we uh, we have this show nostalgia trap in part is to mm, think the yep. left and the left and the right and everything we never got over the 60s like we never we're yes. still in that story we're still reacting to that yeah. story and and yep. your book seems like it's tapping into that really real in a really deep and dark way because to me it's like you know I'm thinking about like um, you, we started here th thinking about like your, your sort of nineties experience, yeah. you know, yeah. and like the animal, like the animal, animal rights movement. Right. And the ELF, like yeah. learning about that shit, I, I couldn't help connect it to the weather under underground. I wonder if like those, were those groups seeing themselves as part of that con continuity, you know, if they're like, the, yeah. we're, we're, we're picking up on the weather underground because that other part of me, like, I remember a really actually signal moment in my life, yeah. um, was was seeing on TV the ELF. You may remember this. That like ELF, like I think they they like set fire to a bunch of SUVs at like some. This was in like yeah. the, the height of the Bush era. Like we're talking about oil and everything else. Yeah, all these I SUVs. I was in Eugene. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So those were maybe some other places, but the bit, there was a really big one at, in Eugene. Yeah, and I remember watching that on TV, and I was watching. I was at my parents' house, and I said something like, "That's far out" or something. You know, I was like, <laughs> I thought that was cool because I was like a teenager yeah. or whatever, and or, or a young person. And my parent, my dad was so mad. He was just like, "There's nothing cool about that. We went through this in the '60s." You know, <laughs> this kind of shit goes nowhere. It just turns everyone yeah. into really angry people, and like. It's yeah. it's kind of incredible because we're still in that legacy and we're and it's and here it is like I don't know the January sixth ma thing made me think like God we're gonna fucking act this out again in a slightly different way and yeah but it's even scarier now because I mean uh, there's just so much to say and it's like, it's kind of emotional too but I mean yeah I mean I, yeah I still have my moments around you know like shit what what else the what the fuck else are we gonna do like, yeah. It's, yeah like climate change you know. 
But anyway, Dude, like, some, are we someone, to do? someone yeah. self-immolated, right? Like someone set oh, themselves God. on fire. Yeah, I know. Just the other day. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've we've talked about Norman Morrison on this program a lot. A yeah. guy that that yep. set himself on fire and killed himself at the Pentagon in front of Robert McNamara's office, basically, in, in November of '65. And yeah, I'm glad you brought up the emotion part of it because yeah. that part of it is something we try to tap into here, and something I definitely feel a lot. I feel like yeah. when I see those self-immolations, I'm like, fuck, man. Like, yeah. what what else is there to do but set yourself on fire in front of people to, like, make them pay attention? I don't know. It's so, yeah, but, so intense. Yeah. It is. It is. But, like, I mean, so I feel that, that emotion. And then at the same time, you know, I personally think the way – if there's hope for creating change to a more peaceful and just world and getting things like a Green New Deal to, like, help save us from the cl from climate change and, like – improve the economy so people have can have a future we need mass movements and strategies for organizing regular people and making them feel like it's worth their time to get their their precious limited almost non-existent free time to get involved in movements and that's really hard i think mm -hmm. we're still living with the consequences of like the mccarthy era in that regard yeah but we totally. can come back to that you know yeah. you know and but um I think that though that the that this current and the, the, that this like and you even see in some of the prison abolitionist stuff that I've seen crop up in the last two years. It's like, yeah, we want prison abolition, but we also just want to fucking destroy the cop cars. And like they're not just going to go away. And now now there's a whole bunch of people and it's not even covered in the news. There's like been hundreds of people prosecuted for. Um, there was a, a somebody just got sentenced five years, a woman from Tacoma. Like, where are all the people who are like the academics on? you know yeah on twitter are they are they organizing the defense fund for these people you know yeah but, i know that's you know, that shit drives yeah. me crazy all that like yeah. ACAB and like defund and bullshit yeah. it became so easy and yeah and 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 to me i'm like yeah fucking a a cab defund yeah. abolish yeah. and part yeah. of me is like yeah of course but the other part of me is like how um because we've we have yeah. gone down this road before i mean we burned the police cars in the 60s i mean the, you're talking about groups that already went to the point of assassinating police officers you know what yeah. i mean like we they were went disciplined there. they were they knew what they like not always sometimes they were but some of them were like disciplined they're like we're taking this seriously as a military operation right you know? so it's already um, like people are yeah. the 60s is like all the logical endpoints of that yeah. have already been fucking played yeah. out you know what i mean yeah. i don't know yeah and we are in a different moment but we're in a scarier moment because now the right like where's the left now i mean as an organized movement it's like we don't even need COINTELPRO pro because we have left twitter just we were just this, we can just destroy each other on there and then meanwhile <laughs> the right now they're trying to figure out for the midterm elections how to do january 6th with legitimation yeah and to right to in institute minority rule by how, how are we going to do it right right republican party yeah, yeah. and you know what? it's going to be anti-communist and anti-antifa i mean it's scary man and they have the tools of the war on terror now they could yeah i mean they could be sent i don't want to give them any ideas but i think about the people who could be sent to guantanamo it's mm -hmm. fucking scary yeah so i think that's what we're facing and like i don't know like <laughs> i'm like that the, the resistance is like the what's the resistance it's not mm. even anything it's like yeah i mean yeah and like this if the if the ma if the, if the right took yeah. over my town i don't know who i would go to for help you know what i mean like because it's like the cops <laughs> you can are with come them. to my house <laughs> yeah you can come to my house but now uh, i already gave i should have just told you that like on signal or something everyone will everyone it. will take the highway to eugene oregon actually and that would be the place we all we all get together <laughs> yeah, and reboot the left um because Build some trenches yeah yeah, man, I'm with yeah. you. I, I, this is part of what we, we, the end points we get to on this show is sort of like, well, where, where do we go from here? And it does seem like uh, the, the left, the American left needs a reboot badly. I love that idea. Who needs COINTELPRO when you got left Twitter? Uh, yeah. We'll just cancel the fuck out of each other until no one, no one says anything. <laughs> Yeah, this was fun, Daniel. Um, Thank you. Wanna, it's wanna... an honor and a pleasure. Yeah, for sure. And you should come back on the show. We we have a lot to talk about. I feel like I'd love to talk with you about the '90s and all that stuff. Oh um, yeah, I'm totally. Gonna come back sometime. Um, Daniel Chard, fun. your book. I want to say the name of it again. Um, wait, I dropped the tab. You say the name of your your book. No, here it is. Uh, Nixon's War at Home: The FBI, Leftist Guerrillas, and the Origins of Counterterrorism by Daniel Chard. Thank you so much for joining me. This was awesome. Thank you, David. Take care. 
Well, all right. I think that's going to do it for Nostalgia Trap today. I want to thank my guest, Daniel Chard. Super, super fun conversation about topics that I love talking about. So maybe we can have Daniel on again in the future for a bonus conversation. Speaking of bonus conversations, if you want to hear more Nostalgia Trap stuff, you can do it at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. We appreciate it. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.